Is there anywhere on earth more blessed than the Italian peninsula? Physically, from the Alps in the north to the valleys and volcanoes of Sicily in the south, its landscape is as beautiful and varied as any on this planet. Its benign Mediterranean-dominated climate finds its equal perhaps only on the northern and central coast of California. Its language, the Italian language, well, it's unique. As lyric, as beautiful, as expressive as any linguistic construct ever conceived by human or bird or whale or dolphin. And Italy's history, its culture, its art and architecture, its cities, its food, its wine, ah, the brilliance of Italian life, the Italian conviction, the Italian worldview that life should, that life must be lived one day at a time. Que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. My friends, when we put it all together, there is no place on earth, town for town, mile for mile, like Italy. The cultural heritage we have inherited from this extraordinary place almost defies description. The gifts of the Italian nation, an area less than one half the size of Manitoba or Somalia or Ukraine or the Sichuan province of China, a country one third the size of Mozambique, one sixth the size of Iran, one ninth the size of Sudan and one sixtieth the size of Russia. The gifts of the Italian nation to the rest of the world are staggering and include in but minute part the Roman alphabet and Roman law, the Roman arch and the Roman calendar, toga parties and Romaine lettuce. Well, maybe not the lettuce. Architectural wonders from the Pantheon to the Dome of St. Peter's, from the Duomo in Florence to the Galleria in Milan, from the Etruscan walls at Volterra to the medieval towers of nobility in San Gimignano in Bologna, from the hill towns of Tuscany and Umbria to the ancient wonders of Pompeii and Heraclium and the Forum in Rome, from San Marco and the Doge's Palace in Venice to, too well, to everything in Venice. And the food, oh! The food, bucatini, cannelloni, cappellacci, concigli, farfelline, fettuccini, fusili, gaganelli, lasagna, macaroni, moltagliati, manicotti, orecchiette, pepperadelli, penne, quadruci, ravioli, rigatoni, spaghetti, spaghettini, tagliatelli, tagliolini, tonaleri, tortellini, tortelloni, vermicelli, ziti, and that's just the pasta, my friends, just the pasta. Can any of us imagine life without pesto sauce, risotto, calzone, mozzarella, minestrone, focaccia, parmesan, or antipasti? Well, neither could the Italians, and that's why they invented them. Indeed, Catherine de' Medici, the Italian Catherine de' Medici, who lived from 1519 to 1589, is credited with being the godmother of French, French cuisine. In volume four of the great French encyclopedia, published in 1754, we find the following entry, and I quote, The Italians made the French acquainted with the art of dining well the excesses of which so many of our French kings tried to suppress, but finally it triumphed in the reign of Henry II, when the cooks from beyond the Alps came and settled in France. And that is one of the least debts we owe to that crowd of corrupt Italians who served at the court of Catherine de' Medici here in France. Unquote. Italians explored and mapped the world while the citizens of landlocked nations were still cowering in their sod lean-tos, afraid to fall off the edge of their particular county. Marco Polo was from Venice, Christopher Columbus from Genoa, Amerigo, or America, Vespucci was from Florence, and Giovanni da Verrazzano was likewise a Florentine. And Italian writers and philosophers, artists and architects, the scientists, technologists and designers... Where do we begin? Italian writers have defined expression and lyricism in the written word, from Dante, Boccaccio, and Plutarch in the 14th century to Giuseppe Lampedusa and Salvatore Quasimodo in the 20th. Italian philosophers defined the medieval and Renaissance worlds, from the sacred tracts of St. Benedict, St. Francis, and St. Thomas Aquinas to Machiavelli and the beginnings of secular political science. And of course, the visual and architectural artists, such incomparable artists and architects as Da Vinci, Michelangelo, 
Raphael, Donatello, Bernini, Brunelleschi, Della Francesca, Giotto, and Ghiberti. Scientists from Galileo to Enrico Fermi. Italian inventors and technologists. Hey, the piano was invented by a Florentine harpsichord builder named Bartolomeo Cristofori. The violin, viola, and cello were de facto invented and developed in the northern Italian city of Cremona, where the big dogs were the luthiers Niccolo Amati, Giuseppe Antonio Guarneri, and Antonio Stradivari. And it was Guglielmo Marconi who invented a way to get all those lovely sounds into our cars and homes and places of business via radio waves. Italian design? Italian design. At its heart and soul, from the poorest hill town to the most magnificent palazzo, the Italian genius for design is about uniting disparate parts into a harmonious and engaging whole. From the countless and nameless individuals who laid out their homes and villages and churches and town squares with an eye to aesthetic beauty and pragmatic functionality, to the sartorial splendors of Gucci and Pucci, Brioni and Armani, Valentino and Versace, to design companies like Alesse, to the automotive wonders of Ferrari, Maserati and Lamborghini, to the movies of Rossellini, Antonioni, Zeffirelli and Fellini, to the statuesque wonder of beauty and pure class that is Sophia Loren. Italian design is about form married perfectly to function. Let us say this again, because this is as true for the operas of Verdi as it is for a perfectly made pair of Italian shoes. At the heart of Italian civilization are the dual elements of functionality and beauty, form married perfectly to function. According to Peter De Piero and Mary Desmond Pinkowish, quote, from the beginning, Italian genius has tended to be practical, down to earth, and concerned with getting things done. But it has also emphasized form, beauty, and radiance. A Roman aqueduct is not only durably functional, but also lovely in its curves and proportions. Perhaps the greatest achievement of the people who brought us the Renaissance has occurred in the useful pursuits of life, law, political philosophy, business practices, anatomy, and other applied sciences, exploration, and those that enhance life's beauties and pleasures, poetry, the visual arts, music, especially in its most visually spectacular form, the opera, etiquette and comportment, film, fashion, and food. The ancient Roman and Venetian constitutions were marvels of their times. The institution of the Catholic Church, largely an Italian creation, has entered into its third millennium, and universities, an Italian invention, seem here to stay as well." Unquote. My friends, in 1524, Count Baldassare Castiglione, who lived from 1479 to 1529, completed his magnum opus, a book he entitled The Book of the Courtier. In it, he writes that all things must be done with sprezzatura, sprezzatura, which might loosely be defined as the art of effortless mastery. For Count Castiglione, Sprezzatura meant that all things should be done, quote, with a stylishness and panache that makes them look easy, unquote. Nowhere in Italian culture is the concept of sprezzatura, the art of effortless mastery, better expressed than in Italian music, with its perfect balance of lyric beauty and structural integrity. Italian composers dominated the musical life of Europe for hundreds of years. Composers like Gesualdo, Palestrina, Gabrielli, Cavalli, Monteverdi, Corelli, Albinoni, Vivaldi, Boccorini, San Martini, Scarlatti, Cesti, Salieri, Rossini, Torrezzetti, Bellini, Puccini, Luigi Nono, Gianfrancesco Malpiero, Bruno Maderna, Luigi Della Piccola, and Giuseppe Verdi. And of course, opera, a word that means literally work, as in all things working together, is the quintessential Italian musical invention. Opera combines stage drama, lyric singing, instrumental music, acting, movement, costumes, sets, and stage machinery into a singular experience, the whole infinitely greater than the parts. Italian opera, at its best, is a perfect example of sprezzatura, elegant, 
lyric, long-lined vocal melodies effortlessly employed in the service of human drama. If, in its long and magnificent history, Italian opera rarely plumbed the metaphysical, the symbolic, and the supernatural aspects of so much German, French, and Russian opera, well, it's because Italian opera, like Italian culture in general, has always been more interested in beauty and elegance than the unconscious underside of human experience and imagination. Musically, expressively, and spiritually, Wagner's Tristan und Isolde and Richard Strauss's Elektra could no more have been written by an Italian than Verdi's Il Trovatore or Regoletto could have been written by a German. Almost from its first days, opera in Italy was a popular as well as an aristocratic entertainment. And as such, Italian opera came to reflect the tastes and interests of a wider, more general public than opera in other nations. A little background is both necessary and instructive. 